Hey everyone, in this episode, we have a young man named Harrison. He comes on the show to discuss his story and what's fascinating about it. He started using drugs at a very young age. I was even blown away by it. He has a story of comeback. He has been in the trenches. He grew up in Massachusetts, overdosed a bunch, put his family through hell and back. But he has a story of recovery that you don't want to miss. And you understand as a parent and a loved one, the things that you should and should not do when it comes to getting your kid clean. You're going to get a lot of pointers in here, when to get involved in treatment, when not to get involved in treatment, and just ways that you can support your loved one when they're on their journey to recovery. Enjoy the show. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we've got Benjamin B. What's happening, everyone? And we have a gentleman by the name of Harrison. Harrison, how are you? Doing great. How are you guys doing? First, good. First yeah. things first. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one that you choose to use. And thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. Right, Ben? Yes, sir. Sounds good. Yeah. What do you think of that, Harrison? I thought it was very catchy. So in the podcasting world, you never know who you're going to run into. And Destiny uh, had a tour scheduled with Harrison. And um, honestly, we've never met. We met 10 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> and just through conversation, uh, I thought to myself, I, I thought self this would be a good interview. And the reason being is because Harrison started sharing a little bit of his story about bodybuilding and stuff like that. And I'm like, hang on, pause. Let me get Ben up here. <laughs> and so I call Ben and Ben, hey, we got another bodybuilder here. Uh, you think <laughs> this makes sense to record? Ben's like, yep, I'll be up. Um, Just want to throw it out there real quick. Tom's always told me and, and Dr. T, they did that mini intervention with me a couple weeks ago. <laughs> uh, bodybuilder, you got to stop this. When's it ending? Good luck. Dude. No, we didn't. We weren't Brings telling people you you have, to, you have to end, Good end it, but <laughs> just rein it in a little bit. So anyways, that's how the connection was made. And uh, so Harrison, um, you know, works in the industry of substance abuse and treatment. Yeah. So Harrison, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, uh, what landed you in the sunny state of Florida, and then we'll go from there. Um, a vicious heroin habit. So <laughs> the um, so I'm originally from Massachusetts, uh, born and raised don't hold it against me. And um, I grew up in like a good family, man. It wasn't like super chaotic, um, very dysfunctional, um, but very loving at the same time. Where in Mass? Um, mm -hmm. Worcester County, like Sturbridge, Southbridge area. Worcester, yeah. So I I had family in Framingham growing okay, up. And my mom would set me up there all the time. I went and I saw the Up and Smoke tour when oh, it, yeah. when it, with Eminem and Dr. Dre <laughs> and all them and Worcester. Yeah, there. What, what do they Little, got there? Listen, Some sort of basketball? Yeah, listen, we're just connected. Uh, that Springfield is the Hall of Fame. Okay. Yeah, where I also used to cop my dope. Um, so it's there's so many things that Massachusetts has to offer. But um, <laughs> Good and bad. <laughs> yeah. Are you a Patriots fan? Um, so I even get jabs for this. I don't care about sports. I just follow bodybuilding. Spray okay. tan dudes and spray tan dudes in tights on stage, and I get my balls That's busted about it. Yeah. Listen, dude. dude straight I'm with as you. an arrow, but that. So that's you ask me what's going on in the sports world. I'm the same way. I'm like, no, no but I can tell you who Mr. Olympia is. Yeah, I can tell you who's competing at the New York Pro this year. I can tell you, you know, what I mean? for Nick Walker. Yeah, yeah you see? know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's I'm not gonna have truth. much to offer this conversation, <laughs> so. which is good because I don't mind sitting back and just listening. All right, so you grew up in Mass and uh, go ahead. So, you know, I uh I started selling drugs by the time I was 12 and I was physically dependent on opiates by the time I was 14. So like first time not having something, getting sick, not understanding what's happening. And then, um, you know, literally getting Suboxone and, and just not, and obviously not using it as prescribed, but like helping me like try to do this. You know what I mean? Because even at that age, the school knew it was up in Massachusetts public schools. Like one thing that I will say about Massachusetts, they do have a lot of help. You know, I didn't grow up with insurance except state Medicaid, stuff like that. And there was still like a bunch of resources and a bunch of people that wanted to help. But me being me, um, I have to hit my head against the wall 101 times just to remind myself that it still hurts. Right. 
So I continue on and do all that kind of stuff. And um, as I was telling you before, when we first met, my last couple senior years in high school um, was actually at an alternative school at a recovery high school over in Worcester, Mass. And um, they were a huge help. Like they really, really were. Um, But I wasn't ready. I was, you know, hanging out in a, you know, it was like a $200 minivan, um, shooting dope, running around, showing up to school when I wanted and all that kind of stuff. And um, the only thing that I think like kept me around is like, I was never a troublemaker. I was never inherently like a bad kid. I wasn't a stick up boy. I wasn't a gangbanger. I wasn't a badass. Like I was a pathetic junkie. Like may I please have more, sir? Like I wasn't, um, it wasn't cool. You know what I mean? And that's how it all started was like when I started selling drugs, like I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be cool. I wanted because like I was a chubby kid that like had a red mohawk and wore black everything and it was into heavy metal like as a young kid. You know what I mean? And actually, like as I was a little kid, I was kind of a bully. You know what I mean? If I'm being honest, because of my home situation and all that kind of stuff. Like, like I said, it's super loving family, but I'm the youngest of four. My brother's a giant. And when I was a kid, I used to get the shit kicked out of me. You know what I mean? As older brothers do, I'm not saying like it was child called it kind of stuff. You know what I mean? But older brother, younger brother kind of stuff, you know? And so then I learned and I continued to grow. And I, then as growing up in school, I started being the bully that like bullied the other bullies and sticking up for the little guy and all that kind of stuff. And, And then it just kept on following me to having these morals (laughs) as like an active addict and still trying to have these things going. But when it really comes down to it, back to the school thing, um, I was never a bad kid. And when I was clean, I'd always do good. And I would literally just have my um, grilled chicken like in big containers and stuff like that. Because a lot of times when I was at that school, I was living in a program. You know what I mean? So... I don't know. I'm not following there. When so you weren't living at home, and you said yeah. you said this was a recovery school. What does that mean? What is that? So essentially, um, now it's heavily harm reduction because it was actually the first like one or two years that the school was even open when I went. So it was a lot of like figuring stuff out, trial and error, and so it's essentially an alternative school for kids with. Um, obviously some type of substance abuse or behavioral issues, you know, at the time it was definitely like 90% of the kids there were behavioral, you know what I mean? Um, You know, they might be there because they're acting up smoking pot. They might've stole their parents narcotic pills that they're prescribed or something like that. And they're messing around starting to get in trouble. Me, I was hiding like needles in my pockets and shooting dope in the bathroom. So there was definitely like, it was four kids like me, but obviously other kids were being placed there as well. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a trial of, or at least at the time it was of like a, a safer place. You know what? A lot of these teachers there had some type of experience with recovery. Maybe they were in recovery themselves. Maybe they just wanted to help, mm-hmm. you know, because if you're a professional in that position, you know, you don't get into recovery for the money. You know what I mean? Um, I know I didn't. So they were truly there to help. And one day, like I said, I was messing around in the minivan, showing up whenever. And they pulled me to the side and they said, Harry, um, there's this detox that just opened. And they're, they're taking scholarships because they just opened and they just need like people in the facility. If we can get you a bed, do you want to go? And how old were you? I was 19. 19. And... um. I didn't have anything going for me, man. I was destined. I had zero work ethic. I was a bum. I was stealing, um, robbing, and doing all the um, cliche things that an addict does to get the next one, you know? And and like I said, I was never inherently a bad kid. I was always well-behaved in school. I always helped out. I just ate my grilled chicken, and I would finish lunch real early so I could go to the school gym for like a half hour, 45 minutes before the next class and all that kind of stuff, you know? Um. And then, so one day I just randomly showed up at school because that was my schedule. I was on my schedule, right? And they pulled me to the side and they talked about this detox that just opened up in Worcester. And do you want the bed? I know we can get you there. 
And I said, yeah, because by that time, my first, by the time I was 19, I was far past counting on both hands, both feet, the amount of detoxes and long-term programs that I've been to. You know, by the time I was 16 is when I started going to detox. And by the time I was 19, like I said, it was, I never lived at home for more than a couple months at a time because I was in a program. I was in jail, um, just doing all the stuff that we do. Like I never had a stable living situation because of my own doing. Like that was my choices and the path that I chose um, not to put that on my family, like whatsoever, right? Because that, that's, I have, I'm the youngest of four and no one went the direction that I went. I was yeah. going to ask you that. Did like your, your upbringing and stuff, nothing in your upbringing, like to an outsider looking in, you know, they see Har- Har- Harris and the heroin addict. Yes. <laughs> um, and they're like, what led up to this? And it was just, you know, it was just the way that you went, the path that you chose. I wanted to be cool. And then me, not knowing that I have that addict gene because addiction and mental health does run in my family, right? And oh, I do okay. believe that there is like a, a genetic component, like nurture versus nature only goes so far, right? And I don't have that off switch like some people do that they talk about in the rooms that they talk about in like general recovery or when you start going to these programs, you start understanding these things. Like my brain doesn't work like Joe Schmoes, you know what I mean? The average guy, the average, average um, Joe on the bus, you know what I mean? And um, so everything that I did was zero to a hundred. And just at that time, my zero to a hundred was just being a fuck a, a bum. Right, <laughs> I took right. being a bum yeah. to a hundred percent. If we're just being honest, you, you said know? something before we started recording about um, like television or something. They were following you around. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So um, I still haven't watched it. Um, I've seen minute clips, and that was one of the only times that I've ever cried in my recovery. I haven't cried in years. Um, maybe I'm broken. Maybe I haven't figured it out yet. Maybe I need to do some more step work. Go through my steps again because I have been through them. Um, but it started out at the recovery high school. I wasn't even really like, go- I wasn't even going to be in it, um, in this like little nightline spiel. Right. And, but I had friends at the school and like I said, like I was a good kid and I was doing well. And everyone said like, you, you know, you got to get Harrison on this, you know, cause I wasn't even really going to the school yet again. And cause I was out in Springfield in a program and the school's in Worcester. So I wasn't attending the school at the time, but they still like, we have to get Harrison on this. And, um, what year time frame was this? So, so was if it. I was 19, it was 2017 ish. Okay. Maybe 16 for the ABC news thing. You, you know what gotcha. I mean? But like towards the end of 16, beginning of 17, somewhere around. So there. how old are you now? I'm 26. Okay. So the, and I'm, and I moved down to Florida in September of 17. So, the beginning was great. Recovering addict Harrison, doing well, young kid, you know, almost an adult, you know, well, legally an adult, but you know how that goes. And sometime later, I ended up relapsing, right, during this process and, mm-hmm. and during this filming. Um, shout out to Aaron for him, ABC, which she actually, I don't even think she works for ABC anymore, so I take that part back. But shout out to Aaron because she's the shit. I still am in touch with her. But um, the... So then it kind of turned into like Harrison the junkie, you know, not Harrison the recovering addict anymore. And it ruined me. It really, really did because I didn't expect it. Was this like a series? Yeah. So they did like multiple kids from the school and all that kind of stuff. And it was on the recovery high school. Like that, that that was, yeah, yeah. So it's not like it just like found me on the street. Right. Um, wasn't that important. And, um, so they did this, they did it on the school. They did, I don't actually, my time frames might be messed up on that because I was going to say something else. But so they did it on the school, all that kind of stuff. And obviously, whatever kids were willing, it wasn't forced whatsoever. Yeah. We were willing. We signed. I was 19. So obviously, I was of age to sign off myself, mm-hmm. you know. And um, they ran it. And whatever kids were shown, they either had parent permission as well or they only did the ones of age. I don't really know, you know. But, um, so once it aired, fast forward a little bit and we'll get back to it. But um, I was like three months in Florida, like 90 days clean. And I saw like that minute clip. 
And I started like breaking down crying because it was literally like cut scenes of like me driving at night and then like my voice over and be like, my name's Harrison and I'm a heroin addict. And I was like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> I was like, that's heavy. Like that. I've never, yeah, I'm in meetings, you know, however many times a week and yeah, my name's Harrison and I'm an addict. You know what I mean? And, and that's fine. I, I'm totally admitting that, but like on national TV where all my family and friends and all these people and, you know, I have, um, you know, my family's are business owners, you know what I mean? And it just like hit me, you know, there's some successful people in my family and stuff like that. And it was just like, what the fuck? Like, this is like, at the time I, I was 19 years old or, or maybe I just turned 20 in Florida sitting in a halfway house and I see this like one minute clip and I was like, this is what everything has brought me to up until this point. You know what I mean? And I was like, what the fuck am I doing? You know, it was definitely like a big aha moment, but it wasn't at the time. Like I didn't have the knowledge for an aha moment to turn me around. It was kind of like an aha moment would still kick me in the pants and kick me when I'm down. I had to learn how to take those aha moments and persevere and like continue and start working harder and do what I had to do or let it beat me up and let it beat me down and not take it as a motivational thing. You know, there was definitely a time <laughs> where that stuff would put me down and not build me up. Right. And that was that time. It was in my early recovery and it was tough, dude. It sounds like a big truth moment for, you know, you said you work steps and like when you do a four step, for instance, like it's a moral inventory, the word moral means truth. And we talk about insanity, a definition of insanity, according to like the big book in layman's terms, it's like the inability to see the truth. But it sounds to me like you seeing that one minute clip is like reality check of like, this is what it really is. What is happening? Because a lot, you know, we live in that fog, man, when we're getting high, like, oh yeah, or an early recovery. We, we don't see the big picture, the reality of what's really going on. We're just like trying to put one foot in front of the other. But you get something like that to happen. It sounds like you like take a look up and you're like, oh my God, look at the chaos <clears throat> and what I've created. And it's like, ooh. And, and you know, my, some of my character defects are people pleasing. Mm -hmm. you know want like caring about others before myself and all that kind of being like a yes man and all that kind of stuff and what i really thought of is like what happens when my mom sees this what happens when my dad watches this what happens when my aunt sees this you know what i mean like my siblings you know and i was like fuck dude it's so funny you mentioned that i was just telling tom and dr t yesterday we were talking about you know we're on episode like almost 400 with the with the podcast and and my aunt I didn't tell you this part. My aunt messaged my mom saying, you must be so proud of Ben, you know, with he's helping so many people. He's on the podcast. this that the other. And my mom actually responded back and she told me about it. She's like, oh, I don't watch it. Yeah. And I, I think for her, you know, she lived it. Yeah. And like, you know, even though I'm doing well today, nearly 14 years sober to like, she doesn't want to, I get where you know, where you're coming from with your mom might look at that. Cause that's in a way, I, I don't know, you know, I can't speak for my mom, but that's kind of what I heard. Like, Oh yeah. I felt horrible. Cause like, you know, I'm the youngest of four. So I'm my mom's baby. You, you know what I mean? And I'm not naive to that. Yeah. Right. And my, my oldest siblings, 10 years older than me, my closest siblings, almost six years older than me. So I was a mistake. And, um, the, uh, 100%, I've talked to my dad about it. He's confirmed. And, um, the, um, she's like, I was trying to make your mom happy and boy, did I fuck up. So, <laughs> the, um, but the, um, she's the one that found me overdosed on the couch. You know what I mean? When I was a kid, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? And I was out for like 40 minutes too. Like for three days after I couldn't remember my social, couldn't remember my address, couldn't remember my phone number, couldn't remember anything. And like, I was turning blue and she thought I was like, she came upstairs and I'm sitting on the couch. Well, dying on the couch and um she like brought up a laundry basket and was like hey come do this and she thought i was just like being a prick ignoring her <laughs> you know what i mean and so she sits on by my feet on the couch and um with the dog his name's opie opie recently passed at the beginning of this year so r.i.p oh, opie um <laughs> yes. oh, he was the bestest boy just throwing that out there i have to give he was my best friend but whatever so opie is playing with my mom and um she starts hitting me, you know what I mean? Thinking that I'm just being a prick, pretending to sleep. You know what I mean? And then she hears like a, what she thought was a snore, but it was a death gargle, you know? And she wakes up or she doesn't wake up. She gets up and like hits me 
And obviously I'm being told all of this um, later in time. And just my eyes roll back. My skin goes completely pale, paler than I already am, which is nuts because I'm a white boy from Massachusetts and um, the sun hurts. <laughs> and um, the and like she sees like the sweat on my brow and all that kind of stuff. And just when it comes to like um, family dynamics and stuff like that, she didn't know what to do to call the cops if she was doing the right thing. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like she didn't know, you know, and um, called up my father and cause he was downstairs at the restaurant and um, you know, and he goes, would you call the fucking cops yet? All this kind of stuff. And the, the chef from my father's restaurants hold me in his arms and he's trying to like wake me up and like, Harry, wake up, Harry, wake up and all this kind of stuff. And my dad's yelling in the corner, like, wake the fuck up so I can kill you. You know what I mean? Like, he's obviously like, what the fuck? And, um, they had to Narcan me a couple of times. They put me in the ambulance. They tell my mom that I'm dead because I was unresponsive still. And um, she's in the ambulance too. And me being a funny guy and all this kind of stuff, I woke up and they go, Harry, Harry, wake up. You just died, kid. And I go, oh, man, that sucks. And you know what I mean? It's like always trying to make another character defect, another coping mechanism yeah. of always trying to make people laugh. Like I was in the stretcher being thrown into the hospital like and i was still making jokes trying to make the nurses laugh and shit you know what i mean like it was the most insane and toxic and now looking back on it you know what i mean it's just the most ridiculous behavior yeah ever so when you when you um you transitioned to florida at what age 19 and that was for treatment so, like I said, I um I grew up on Mass Health, right? So I went to that detox, got scholarship in, um, and I'll try to make this one quick. But so there's this guy named Teddy there. Uh, me and him don't talk too much anymore, but I'll absolutely give him credit. Still, um, he knew a halfway house down here, right? Because I didn't have insurance or insurance that people would want me for, and um, the uh, so. He knew this place with my buddy Max, who's actually deceased now as well. I met him in this long-term program, right? Because like I said, I um, I started going to long-term programs by the time, at a like, young age, court-ordered, all that kind of These stuff. These were right? all in Massachusetts. Yes, yep, okay. all in Mass. Yeah. All paid by the great state of Massachusetts. I kind of want to ask life. some questions about that when we're yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. I, think I got time. Um, and we have a good editor, so. <laughs> but uh, that's... <laughs> but... um. It was, uh, so I met this kid, Max, in this program, iron worker, hard ass, all this kind of stuff. And um, so he was down in Florida and he was at the same halfway house that this guy, Teddy, helped him get to, you know? And um, so, and I met Teddy at this program and I show up to this detox, right? Literally puking over the railing before I admit and Teddy walks out and he goes, hey, Harry, how you doing? And I go, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> because it's Teddy, you know what I mean? From this other program, I never thought I was going to see this guy again a day in my life. You know what I mean? This, it's literally, I was literally patient number one at this facility. Mm-hmm. I was there alone for like two days. You know what I mean? Like, And um, it, it was just absolutely ridiculous. And so fast forward a couple weeks, um, he said, listen, man, um, cause I was touring places in Boston to go to halfway places that I've already been to left in four days, all this kind of stuff. Um, and he said, listen, I got max at this place. He's doing real good. He's got like nine months clean or seven months clean or something like that. Um, so we get max on the phone and his thick Massachusetts accent. He's telling me, um, if you're going to get high, fucking stay. Stay in mass. Don't get high in Florida. It'll chew you up. It'll spit you out. You're going to die down here. Mm-hmm. But if you're ready to get clean, come on, you know. So I call my father and I go, Pops, um, it's a one-way ticket, 105 bucks, Logan to West Palm Beach, and um, let's do it. And I remember, like it was yesterday, the only response my dad had was, kid, let's get you the fuck out of this town, you know. And it gives me goosebumps even thinking about it. And um, because he was down. Those are some serious goosebumps. Dude, I'm fucking. (laughs) You're going to have have to zoom in, editor. (laughs) On my real pale skin, see if the camera can pick it up. But um, the, it was just nuts. Like, and it was a 36 hour decision. You know, like how, 
you know, I work in treatment now and we'll get people to travel same day or next day or whatever. And it's this biggest thing. And sometimes I have sympathy for them, but then I remember it's like, that's the kind of decision that saved my life. That's the best way for it to happen, man. When people say, Oh, I got to think about it. I need a week to close things up. What do you got to close up? Like, come on, like the corner. Yeah, exactly. Close up shop on the corner. Yeah, exactly. The the bill you have to your dope boy. You know what I mean? Like what what do you got to close up? 100%, you know, and it's because I'll think myself out of a good situation 90% of the time, you know? So I remember the night book, because I didn't even tell my mom. Dad knew. My dad knew what he was going to get for saying yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I remember I'm talking to mom. It's the day before the flight. And she goes, who the fuck is sending you down to Florida? I'm going to rip your head off for going. I'm going to rip his head off for helping you get down there. All this kind of shit. You know what I mean? Because she didn't know. You yeah. know? You don't know what you don't know. And that's no one's fault until you know. And um, so... But so to answer your question about treatment, right? So I came straight to Cash Bay halfway, 19 years old, a week's free rent, 300 bucks on a prepaid visa card because my parents didn't trust me. And um, my gym bag, my suitcase, and that was it. And that September will be seven years ago, you know? So, and it was the best decision that I ever made. You know, I tried the whole Google business listing call center shenanigans. I lasted a week. Oh, we can do a whole podcast on stay out of the call centers, right? Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Do it. Don't go. (laughs) um, But um, if if you send your kid down to Florida to go to treatment and they call back and tell you, I got this great opportunity. Somebody offered me a job in a call center and they hire people in early recovery. (laughs) Tell your kid. Don't yeah. do it. 100%. Yeah. Because it was this Google business listing stuff, right? And I couldn't get a sale. So, like, I look up my dad's Google business listing for his business and I call him and I was like, Mom, like, I really need a sale. Just buy this from me. But then, like, I actually looked it up because you can do what they're offering yourself yeah. for free. And I was like, and my sister helps run my dad's business. And I was like, she did a better job than this company would have. <laughs> and yeah. they would have paid two, 300 bucks a week to maintain it. And yeah. My sister Angelique did did it all herself, <laughs> and I was like, "This is bullshit." So, <laughs> they, um, what uh, what your dad had? They it's a family restaurant. Yeah, so restaurants are on all sides of my family. Um, I grew up in restaurants, running around in diapers in them, and um, and then my dad opened his restaurant probably like fifteen years ago or something like that, right? And um, growing up in a restaurant just made me learn one thing, and it said I never want to own a restaurant in my life. <sighs> You know, so if we're being honest and um, what type of food is it? Seafood in Italian, four and a half stars. Um, just I'm not trying to like brag or anything, but it's um, oh, it's good. I don't want to even give out the details. We'll see. But <laughs> yeah, it's a real good spot. Anyway. Plug your dad's spot. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Be like, bro, you can if you want. Go visit my dad. I, I, yeah. <laughs> find out find out the other side of this. Story. Yeah, 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 exactly. The success story. Yeah. The um, no, man, he he's a hard worker, man. And um, but like, honestly, both my parents are and my mom's probably the hardest worker out of any of us. And it's absolutely ridiculous. She owned a company for 35 years, interior design started as wedding dresses. And then she's done jobs in, you know, for Celtics players, the the city hall, like all this kind of stuff and all these cool things. And, um, it's closed now, you know, um, but it was open for more than I could remember. We yeah. actually bought that building, um, that the restaurants in for my mom's business, and um, so my dad actually, you know, broke his foot. Um, the restaurant that he was at before was also family owned, our family, not not my dad specifically, but like who it was, you know, mom and pop, and you know, Rom opened this place as an ice ice cream and hot dog stand eighty years ago now. And turned it into like a multi-million dollar restaurant. You know what I mean? Talk about just like an Italian that went for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Wow. And, um, so all the way, even on my mom's side, her brother owns a couple restaurants in New York and all this kind of stuff. And um, so it's everywhere. And also, like, if we're just being honest, though, that that's an, an environment that perpetuates, can perpetuate addiction. Yeah, you know? I, I, I've shared a lot on, on the podcast, but a big part of my We'll call it contributing issue was that I worked in restaurants, bartending, started in a restaurant. I was like right before I turned 16. Oh, yeah. And man, that played a blip. I won't say like my addiction had already started. However, like the access just became, I mean, the kitchen, the serving staff. 
I was the one that was selling the drugs. Yeah, I was the one that was perpetuating it. Like, I was always the like, everyone's like, oh, this person's a bad influence. That person's a bad influence. And I'm shaking my head and I was like, I'm the one that started this. (laughs) You know what I mean? And I've always been that shithead kid. You know what I mean? So. Since you have experience, I wanted to ask you about Massachusetts stuff. Um, So we had a young lady named Renee that worked with us. What was that? When did she leave? 2018? 2019. She left in 2019 to move back to Mass. She came down here, got sober. She was working with us, basically doing emission stuff. Um, goes back to Massachusetts. And you had mentioned earlier, you had said something along the lines of the school you were at, the recovery school, has become more harm reduction. When she moved back to Mass, she was telling me, and I just want to find this out, and mm-hmm. it's put it this way. Let me preface with this. You can get sober absolutely anywhere. Yeah. But um, the impression that I'm under, obviously, I don't live there. I can't speak to it. And I get to speak with a lot of parents, addicts and alcoholics that will kind of tell me the same thing, that they do have a lot of help up there. But most of it, almost all of it, is uh, MAP programs. They really push Suboxone. They really push Methadone. And... The calls that I get and the feedback that I get from like Renee is like, there's no places that do abstinence based recovery. People get on this box. And if you listen to our episodes prior, you know, we just recorded one yesterday as well that brought up Suboxone and Subicade and all that. Like, it's not black and white, you know. I agree with that. It was part of my process. Mm-hmm. Suboxone, methadone um, kept me alive for sure. But, like, it's like they get you – what I'm hearing is they get you started on that, and then there's no, like, real solution after. Is that accurate? I think um, for me to speak on that as a blanket statement, I think, is a big ask. You know what I mean? Because It's not a know, blanket no, statement. No, no, right. Yeah, definitely. So, but, like, also in my experience, mm-hmm. just in – and maybe even somewhat of my opinion, right, um, is that it's absolutely skewed. And it's probably not far off. And it's another way for, um, and this might sound a little conspiracy theorist, but I really don't mean it like that, but it's it's another money grab. It's another thing to bill off of. And I do believe, um, you know, there's many different ways to skin a cat. Yes. Um, if there's anything that my recovery has taught me is that my way is not the only way. Correct. Right? Yeah. Because honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, the how – of recovery is that understands that like I have to realize that I'm not always right. Right. And what worked for me, what kept you alive might kill me and what kept me alive might kill you. Mm -hmm. So like, that's a real tricky thing to deal with too. You know, um, do I agree with what that person was telling you is that, um, it's very harm reduction esque now, um, from what I hear. Yes. And do I personally agree with it? To that level, no. Um, I do believe harm reduction can make sense in certain situations for certain people. Do I think a lot of people use it as a crutch? Yes, I do. And that's my opinion, and I will stay on it. You know, um, Does that mean that I don't support it? No. I think it has a place. I do too, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's been our stance the whole time. Yeah, we have the same exact stance. Like, yeah. We'll never sit here and like bash it. No. We'll, we'll, sh- we'll share the pros and the cons. Agreed. I think at the end of the day, there's no argument that somebody who's completely sober, stays sober and clean, is a better outcome than somebody being on, say, for instance, yeah. Suboxone for the rest of their life. Like yeah. You're just more cognitively there. Yeah. It's 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 a better quality, yeah. if you will. I have someone in my family that will remain unnamed that I'm just really close to. But um, this person, you know, they were on Subox and maintenance for 14, 15 years. Mm-hmm. You know, um, successful person. And um, they actually just kicked it cold turkey, like within the last like six or seven days. So like, you know who you are, right? But, um, but it, again... It was because, you know, the person had a name in a specific town and was very well known. And so they went to a private doctor, not like the clinic in town and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And this person was prescribed two eight milligram films a day, which is, in my opinion, asinine. And um, for the most part, right, I don't want to like speak in general terms or just like blanket yeah. statements, but um, the, this person asked to be lowered and the doctor said no. You know, 
So that's an issue, right? Is that a, a billable insurance thing? Is that this? Is it that? So the person just and I. This is not a recommendation, but I'm just speaking this person's story. Cut themselves back, you know, from yep. two eights a day to one to half a one to maybe the other half if the person thinks that they needed it, which again was just mental, right? Um, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, and now, like I said, that person um, who I care a lot about, uh, you know, has some stuff going on in, in a positive light, believe it or not. It's just not yeah. like consequences is why they got off. But they kicked it, you know, um, weaning themselves off because the resources to get off and get better were not as readily available as to stay on. You yes, know? that's a really good way to put it. They'll yeah. get you started quick and then you're kind of stuck. Yeah. Because yep. that was my experience. And, you know, as it being part of somebody's process, 14 years, a little long. I actually have a friend that just after 14 years of being on it, too, called me up. He's like, dude, I'm finally ready to get off this. Can you get me into detox? Yep. Literally, this was a month ago. Um, but also, like, for what it's worth, you know, 14 years is a long time. But it gave the opportunity for that aha moment, like... This is not serving me. Took 14 years, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah. It really is because they're alive. Now they've made the decision themselves. Oh, yeah. And so, and the other part, I just want to share on my experience with that because what you said, this was with the methadone clinic in, in particular. I went in and said, I want to get lower. And th their response was, We actually need to raise your dose. It's crazy. Because you're not thinking right and you're having <laughs> cravings. And I'm like, <laughs> And that's like we got in an argument, and I, and I, I think I've told this story maybe brief. I won't get into the details of it, but I slammed my methadone cup down, and it spilled everywhere. And I like walked out, and they're like, "You can't do that." I'm like, "Watch me!" <laughs> yeah. And then a day later, I'm back in there in tears and full blown withdrawal because oh, yeah. I missed the day. Like, and I'm like, but at that point, they were willing to hear me out. Like, and they brought me down. I think I got down to like sixty milligrams, and then. Yeah. That's when the DEA stepped in one day. <laughs> well, that was because I, I was on turkey. the clinic. Yeah, yeah, I was on the clinic, and um, they would bump me up and stuff like that. And so I found out as good, right? Sometimes our conniving behaviors from addiction kind of works out. But I found out that if I missed a day, this specific clinic that I went to would actually drop me like three or five milligrams or something. Like, obviously, I don't really remember the exact. Yeah. Rest, but they would drop you if you if you skipped a day. Mm hmm. So I started skipping days <laughs> so to purposely get dropped. Ah. You know what I mean? And um, and then I just went cold turkey. At, once I got to 40 milligrams, I just went cold turkey. I obviously not condoning this. Um, I'd have like a handful of colonidine and a bigger handful of melatonin to try to get like four hours of sleep a night. You, you know what I mean? Just yeah. to try to like get some sleep, you know, because I was just detoxing cold turkey off methadone. You know you, what I mean? You know, it's interesting. Dr. T, Tom, and I, we were having a sidebar. I think it was yesterday about we were actually talking with a mom whose son went through our program and is now doing very, very well That's for awesome. himself. And she was talking about she was giving us like feedback for the podcast because in the struggles that she had, like with finding resources and who to trust and who really knew what they were talking yep. about. And I think that what you just said about, you know, wanting to get off this boxing, but they actually tell you to stay on. And then me with the methadone thing, like we were talking about how important it is, even amongst professionals, to find someone that is specifically uh, an addictionologist. Because this mom was really frustrated. She, yes, sir. She, I'll nearly quote her, but it was something along the lines of like, my son sat in front of a ton of different psychiatrists and none of them were helpful at all. And they're supposed to be the professionals. So it's a big part of this process for any family or loved ones listening, like, there is a difference between an addictionologist, which is a medical professional trained in addiction, versus some doctor that just has the ability to prescribe Suboxone. Because when I was at the... And I, I don't think that these professionals have malintention. Oh, no. I don't Not think a, so either. They just don't know. There was one time at the methadone clinic where I was using heroin while I was on methadone. Yeah. A, a lot Who of wasn't? it. Yeah. And <laughs> when I failed my first drug test with them... I remember my therapist that I was assigned to was like, well, what happened? I was like, well, my back really hurt really bad. And legitimately it did. I have like some crushed disc. Oh, okay. And I'd, 
regardless of what the pain was, it's not an excuse for me to take an opiate anyway. Right. I'm not trying to say that. Heroin but off the street. <laughs> but I just remember her response being like, oh, I understand. We definitely got to get you on a higher dose of methadone. Versus if somebody if somebody tells me that they have back pain, so they had to shoot heroin here, I'd be like, bro, are you nuts? Yeah. Like That's where insane th- thinking. They literally, this lady literally co-signed it. And I'm like, yeah. They just don't know, dude. And that's why, like, I can't, you know, and I think I've even said it since we've been recording, like, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's not always your fault that you don't know at that moment. But if you don't strive to become informed and you're in this field, that is your fault. You know what I mean? And that is um, ignorant to not try to be a little bit more. Because I actually was speaking to a parent, actually very recently. And their son was trying to leave, right? And I visited this gentleman at another facility to make sure that he was being genuine to come to where I work now in in the company that I represent. And because I work at a very genuine spot, right? Mm -hmm. And and one that I don't mind putting my face next to whatsoever, you know, that I actually want to. And um, so I was making sure that, you know, make him feel comfortable, make sure that he's actually willing to do this, all that kind of stuff, shoot the breeze with him for 40 minutes, you know, um, try to get to know him a little bit. And he was gung ho all about it. He was going to be like captain recovery. Yeah. You know, and it was his first time in treatment. And so within being at our facility for like five or six hours, he already has a flight booked home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause they get their cell phones or they get yeah. this and you know, that one, that taste of freedom. Right. And um, so I'm talking with the dad release of information, all that kind of stuff. Right. And, um, the dad is completely co-signing his son coming home. And I start getting angry. Like, I'm not even going to lie. Right. Because it's like, dude, I, I was a patient for years and years. And I pulled the same exact stuff with my, and it was this person's first time in treatment. And I, I've pulled this so many times again and again with my family. And I knew exactly what's happening. I saw the red flags that, the patient would say this, but then I get this piece of information from the dad. So now dates aren't lining up. Um, the reason why he's leaving isn't lining up, you know? So obviously these are red flags of character defects of trying to get of manipulation, you know, and trying to make the situation go. Do you want like those core behaviors that I know at least I had in the beginning of my recovery, because from addiction to early recovery, they're going to bleed in. Right. Um, and the dad was completely co-signing it, but here's the thing in, in the point that I'm making, he goes, um, What's your credentials? I'm a high school dropout, by the way. You know what I mean? And I got my GED in Florida just because, like, I thought it was good to do. Yeah. Um, And I go, well, sir, (laughs) because I'm not going to lie to the guy. Like, I don't lie. You know know what I mean? I said, well, you know, I was a patient for, at the time, more than a third of my life because I got clean young. And, um, you know, and I've worked in the field for five years now, you know. And like practical experience and going through this. And he goes, oh, so you don't have any credentials. And I was like, you piece of shit. <laughs> and I was, like, <laughs> I was like, yes, you're right, but you're an asshole. <laughs> and, um, but, and I was like, dude, I'm not trying to get over on you. Like I'm, I'm one of these guys that like gives a shit and I'm trying to level with you like man to man, human to human. You know what I mean? Like these are the red flags that your son's presenting. Um, please do something about it. And I started talking about families and boundaries and having healthy boundaries with families in early recovery and all these kind of things. And it was in one ear, out the other. And like, I'm sitting outside the gym, I'm hopped up on pre-workout <laughs> and I'm like, literally like, and I get a call or I get a text from my boss, please call so-and-so you, EC, you, you know, emergency contact to try to talk to him. So like, I'm hopped up. I already drank my pre- It was a 20 minute drive to the gym. So then I'm sitting outside the gym, like getting all itchy and getting all hopped up for another 20 minutes on the phone with this parent. And by the end, it almost ruined my workout. Like I got so mad, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's my shit. If we're just being honest yeah. to let it get to me like that. But it's the insidiousness of this disease because it is a disease, right? I think we can all agree on that. I yes. believe. And, um, according to the AMA, American medical association, you know, and to essentially let your disease win, in that mindset. You know what I mean? In my sponsorship family, before we start our separate, you get a few assignments, right? And one of the assignments is how is your disease lying to you lately? 
you know, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not um, performing to the best of my ability. Maybe I'm not doing this. Maybe I'm not doing that. Um, people don't really like me. They just, you, you know, like all this stuff, like an early recovery, you know what I mean? And um, how my disease is lying to me lately is probably would look a lot different now than the first time I went through my steps, right? That assignment. But um, but all I could think about was that assignment for this guy. And I was like, because I had a conversation with him. And I was like, are you making this out of your best interest or your own interest, if you know the difference? And he goes, yeah, this is my own interest, not my best interest. Agreeing with me on everything. He goes, the flight's already booked. And I was like, dude, you just booked that. That's 24 hours. You can refund that. And he goes, yeah, I'm still going. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, we see it a lot, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad because I've been there. I I was that client at one point. Like I, I said, I don't want to lose my hundred and five dollar flight. Yeah, I'm like, yes. bro, you're gonna lose your life for a hundred and five bucks. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and the thing on. with this gentleman, he was very capable. He had a, a head on his shoulders. You know, he was like, those just, are the worst kind. <laughs> my sponsors told me he goes, I've never met someone too dumb for this program, but I have met people too smart. Amen you know, to that. You know, mm -hmm. and if that wasn't the situation thinking ourselves out of a good situation, right? Like we talked about before, hopping on a plane in 36 hours. That was me. Sometimes we have patients that, you know, they think we're pushing and I'm like, y yes, I am pushing, but for a damn good reason, you know, for like, I'm genuinely from the bottom of my heart trying to help you, you know? And, um, and you're going to think yourself out of a damn good situation. Yeah. The big book talks about, you know, when we believe in our ability to surmount all the other obstacles in our life, like because we're good at a lot of things, we think we can apply that same willpower, if you will, to our disease, mm -hmm. and we fall flat on our face every time. It's it's the smart people, the intellectuals, that end up running the longest, the hardest, and end up dying. Oh, yeah. It's the guys that come in here and they're like, Durr, just, just tell me what to do. And and you're perfect. Like, perfect. Dude. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and Let I me show you. And I don't know is like my favorite answer to hear from somebody. And that's the best thing because, again, I keep on bringing up my sponsor, right? Because he's been my grand sponsor. He's been probably one of the most consistent men in my life since I've been in Florida, right? Because I've had a few, I've always stayed in the same family, but I've had different sponsors and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. And he goes, I don't know is a great answer because I don't know leaves a whole hell of a lot of opportunity. Yes. You know, and it's just like these like one liners that like get me, but like make a whole hell of a lot of sense. You know, it, it really, really does. That's one of the reasons why we started this podcast to begin with was to help educate the families on what the right things to do versus the wrong things. And <clears throat> one of the biggest issues that we do run into are parents derailing things and it happens it happens way too often and not even just parents but sometimes spouses children if you're a mother or a father here and you have kids back home you know maybe with your spouse and there's this constant pull this tug of and and you know we have to sit back and look at the situation because it's tough it's tough for a mom to sit here as she's got three kids back at home and her husband's back at home. And, you know, we try and, you know, sympathize with that a little bit, but in the, it's fun. The episode that just came out today uh, is an episode that um, destiny and I recorded, which was the top three objections that we get from people. I have your phones over here. Okay. The top three objections that we hear when, trying to get somebody into treatment, you know, and generally it's, I can't go to treatment because of work. I can't go to treatment because of, um, uh, uh, leaving, you know, yeah, geographical family, yeah, change yeah. going away for, you know, X amount of days, 1500 miles away, blah, blah, blah. And then the other one being, um, you know, I just can't be away from my kids and stuff like that. And it's like, none of those are really good excuses. No. Yeah. You know, and the, the only thing, and I'll, I'll say this is that, and I did say in the episode, that's more talking to married people, people that have the abilities to do it. I'm not so much, I don't have the same stance as I do with like single moms or single dads that have kids. And like every situation is different, but even then it's like rally around 
you know, whatever supports that you have to see if there is some sort of opportunity that could be afforded to you to be able to go to treatment because, and then the big thing is, and I tell this and I know Ben does too, when we interact with parents, loved ones in any sort of capacity that their loved ones come to us, we tell them when the plane gets here and they get in our care, you take a back seat. Yeah. You are as uninvolved as humanly possible until we, until we tell you otherwise, if it's an absolute emergency, sure, fine. But you don't have to call us with, Hey, what's Billy doing today? Or, Hey, you know, what Billy do yesterday? Billy called me yesterday and he said that he wants to come home. And it's like, listen, we know all this stuff, you know, oh, yeah. don't try and dictate treatment or, or, and most parents are good with that. Most parents will say, you know what, we're, we don't know what we're doing. You guys just handle it. And, and to even speak on that a little bit, because, um, you know, September will be in Florida for seven years, but this past March, I only celebrated five years clean. Right. Mm. Because, you know, I had a loved one die and, um, before he died, you know, my, my sister calls and all this kind of stuff. And, Hey, you know, Pepe's dying. My grandfather, hey, do you want to come say bye to him before he actually goes? And I go, yeah, you know, but there's an ulterior motive in my head that I'm not willing to look at, maybe not able to look at, willing to look at whatever the case may be. Right. And, um, to go back home. And so I talked to my supports, my sponsor at the time, um, a couple of my sponsorship brothers, stuff like that. And who in their right mind is going to tell a young man who's doing well, 18 months clean at the time. No, you can't go see your dying grandfather. And I, like everything's lining up. I'm doing good. And, you know, I, I did the whole recovery thing. I didn't do treatment. I hopped right into um, one of the 12 step fellowships and just went for it. You know what I mean? And, um, but it's those ulterior motives that we don't always understand because my parents were huge enablers until they weren't until they kind of got hipped to all this. Right. So to make a long story short night before I, um, I, my flight's back to Florida to come home because Florida's my home now. And um, I get high, you know, after the services. And everyone's like, oh, he went home for the funeral. He wanted to get, he got high because, you know, Pepe died and all this. No. I absolutely had something that I wasn't looking at, that I wasn't working on, that I was not getting honest about. And I had like an ulterior motive for going home, right? So I'm in the Atlanta airport. I'm telling my parents, I'm coming home, all this kind of stuff fuck this I'm out. And, um, because I have such a close knit sponsorship family, um, my fam, my, my dad and my sister actually had one of my sponsorship brothers phone numbers. You know, I, I'm the godfather of his oldest child. I worked for him for some time and, um, great guy helped me out a lot. It's actually where I weren't learned my work ethic because I was a bum, even in early recovery you know, trying to work these like grocery store jobs and all that kind of stuff. And, um, my dad calls him and I've never seen my dad cry before. I saw like a couple tears at his mom's funeral. You know what I mean? And, um, and this gentleman's telling me that, um, my father's literally crying to him on the phone saying, he's my son. I can't tell him. No, you have to tell him no, that he can't come back to Massachusetts. And it was the hardest thing for my dad, you know what I mean, to be able to do for his youngest son doing well. I was drunk as shit before I got on the plane, you know what I mean, because we lived above the restaurant and all that kind of stuff. So I just took some booze, put it in a water bottle because I got high the night before. So I'm still continuing to numb feelings, yeah. act on impulse, you know what I mean? And this is after 18 months clean and doing very well and finding some success in my life, you know, not necessarily monetarily, kind of, but um, but not really. And um, things were more affordable it was before COVID, but um, the um, so, <laughs> but um, I don't want to say any key words and and get this uh, canceled, but yeah, the, right. um, so the um, but it was even like it's it must be so hard for a parent, you know what I mean, to be able to tell their loved one no, especially even after doing well, because learning these boundaries when your child has been messing up for years it's a whole hell of a lot easier to tell them no when they've been doing good for the past year and a half and now we have to remember well, what were our boundaries like what what did we do to be able to draw these lines in the sand so he doesn't 
continue. You know what I mean? Once and, they have that drug and that alcohol, and now you're battling the disease again. You're uh, oh yeah. Now you're battling the disease, not Harrison. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And I also, you know, I'm a huge proponent of who you surround yourself with in life. You show me your five closest people, and I'll show you where you're going. Yeah, through and through. It's Tom's right? favorite quote. Yeah, it's the shit because it makes sense. And um, so I had sponsorship brothers, right? And I was living in a three quarters house. And they were like, um, I think Harrison got high, you know, up north. Because, like, I flew up to Mass, like, the day of my 18 months in the program that I work. They celebrate 18 months. Just another 12 so fellowship doesn't. And, um, <laughs> is that a job? Or, uh, so, what is that? Um, but um, the uh, – and I didn't want to pick up my 18-month key tag. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to go to the gym. And my buddy was like, what the fuck? You've been talking about picking up this 18-month key tag practically since you hit your year. You know what I mean? Like, you think I'm stupid? You know, yeah. bullshitter trying to bullshit? Or trying to bullshit a bullshitter? And uh, he ratted me out. Piece of shit. But it was one of the best things he ever did. No, you know? it's, it's part of your story, man. Yeah, and it, and it was great because I got honest. I was able to stay. And I've been clean since. And actually, so my clean date now, just crazy how things work out, right? Is the grandfather that deceit that's dead? It's his birthday now. Oh, you know nice. what I mean. So it's just like those little things oh, that nice. happen. That's you, cool. you know what I mean. And I, and I didn't even know. You know. I want to touch on one thing real quick before you wrap it up. Yeah, and we're gonna have to have you come back on to talk the bodybuilding stuff. So all right, good. Yeah. That was my intention. Just focus on one thing and this, make you guys. Get, bring I want to say something for the parents and loved ones because you brought up an example where you had it out. You were at the gym and you had it out with the parent and found yourself angry because they wouldn't listen. And then right. Tom talked about setting boundaries. Just a real quick, there was a case I had in 2017. They send their son down here from, I'll say Minnesota because that's where. Yeah, I won't give any more details on family info from there, but um. It was funny because their son was in treatment here and they were like dangling the carrot that he could come home, but he wasn't doing well in treatment the entire time. And the dad calls me and it wasn't through insurance, just to be straight up. They paid cash. Mm -hmm. um, and the dad calls me and he's like, he's like, man, he's not doing well there. You guys aren't doing what you said you would do. And come to find out, like on the back end, I'm like, well, your boundaries are weak and you know, him and I, I remember where I was standing. I was standing out in front of a detox, like pacing on the sidewalk. Like I was heated. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, because behind the scenes, unbeknownst to him, his they were on the phone with him every day, listen to his complaints, listen, and they were the ones keeping him in the sick mindset. Yep. But they didn't know. You don't know what you don't know, like yep. you said. But where I'm going with this is I was the guy that was, at that time, willing to tell them the truth. And this yeah. comes down to, like, your ethics, so to speak. You're going to tell them the truth no matter what. And the funny thing is, is, like, he ended up saying, I just looked at him, or didn't look at him, I was on the phone, but I'm like, you know what? If we're not the place and you don't feel like we're doing the service, I tell you what, get your kid a plane ticket, and we'll give you your money back today. And he said, what? I said, I'm just trying to tell you the truth right now and you're not listening and if you're going to derail your kid's treatment we don't have a chance at helping them take your money and take your kid and when you're ready call me back and he said what i'm like bro and from that point on he's like look i changed my mind he actually called me the next day i was walking into Publix. called me the next day i was walking in Publix after the gym well, you made good money you shop at Publix. yeah and uh <laughs> And uh, he had the the cool thing was his son did go home and had some mental health stuff going on, but when his mental health stuff started going on and he kind of went south for probably a good couple of years, the dad would call me all yep. the time because he knew I was going to tell him the truth and he knew I was going to try and guide him in the right direction. And uh, we we've, we've actually like become friends. Like it yeah. started with a disagreement, you know, and that disagreement brought us closer because you stick to the truth. You just tell the truth. It's, we got it. It's not about the money. It's about helping people. Right. And, um, his son is since has gotten some significant sobriety time now awesome. doing very well. I follow him on Facebook. <laughs> Do I know who it is? Yes. You'll be blown away when I drop the name <laughs> afterwards. It? Okay. Doing very well today. And, I'll be honest with you. I, I, this is like a, a miracle story in itself. Yeah. So, yeah. but uh, point is, is 
listen to guys like Harrison that are telling you the truth. You might not want to hear it, but at the end of the day, like you were talking about the credential thing, you were in the trenches yourself, dude. Like you can't get better credentials than that. I mean, on paper you can, but yeah, and just, I'm not yeah. a doctor. It'd be cool to be. No, a doctor, that, that's but, what I'm saying. Like it's yeah. not like PhD Harrison, you know, yeah. D or anything like that. But like, dude, it's not like. I've been coming up with these scenarios in my head, right? Because we're compulsive still, even in recovery of like, well, what is, would you rather the dude just out of like carpentry school or something like that? And he has all these certifications or whatever, just making up shit in my head or the guy that's like built his own house and has been doing it for years. Like I'm getting resentful in my head. You know yeah. what I mean? This dude well, you could look me. at it even, yeah. you know, like an electrician or something or whatever. Yeah. I mean, they go to. Well, I'll use my own. I'll use my own experience. I was. Um, I went to school to be a mechanic, yeah. and I went through this two-year program, technical school, to work on General Motors cars, yada yada yada. And I grad. Well, came out of school, graduated the school, and I'm a certified GM technician. That didn't mean nothing. <laughs> I still didn't know because I hadn't really. I could do all the basic stuff, change brakes and, you know, do oil changes and all the maintenance stuff. You know, I could even pull an engine if I had to. But when it came to like diagnosing an issue, electrical and like all the intricate things that goes into working on cars, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, thankfully, I had my dad there who was a mechanic for 30 years, 40 years that never went to school for it. He just perfect example you know started working on cars and lo and behold with the experience and doing the things i became relatively good until i didn't and you know started (laughs) blowing up motors because i was all whacked out on booze and xanax (laughs) and at the time you were working in the field for five years you said too so it's like dude in five years you see a lot of scenarios a lot of tom and i we've worked with thousands of people at this point Right. Yeah. Like we got a pretty good idea what works and what doesn't right. work. And I was a patient for even longer. You know what yeah. I mean? It's not just like right. I found a solution in yeah. in in these fellowships that we attend and stuff like that, like the end of it is giving back. Giving what was freely given to us. Right. And that's how we keep it. Right. And like like I said, man, I got into treatment to help. You know what I mean? I I promise I'm nowhere near rich. I'm in crippling debt. And the, um, but like, I'm doing what I do because like, I genuinely give a shit. And sometimes it does get through to these people. You know what I mean? That like, I I promise I I don't, in my scenario, like I don't make money helping people get into treatment. I do get my annual salary. It is my living. And I do want to continue it as a career, but I don't like bonus because I got someone into treatment. I wouldn't want in my perspective I have never, and I believe I would not want to work for a company that bonuses me for getting someone in. You know what I mean? Because then that's an ulterior motive. That's an incentive on my end. I don't want that. You know what I mean? I do want to be able to live my life well and comfortably. I drive a soccer mom's car. It doesn't need to be nice. I still pay too much for it. You know what I mean? Like I don't need all these. I'm not a very, uh, I don't care about monetary things as much. You know what I mean? Like this is a supplement company. You, you know, it's not like the nicest. You know what Just I mean? Give like, me a barbell and a bag yeah. of chicken. And yeah, I'm <laughs> and I'm good. And I'm good. I swear to God, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, give me a barbell, a bag of chicken, and a and a dope fiend, and I'm a happy camper. <laughs> yeah, and just keep me out of Massachusetts. Well, and listen, we got to wrap this up. Yeah, we're we're an comments. hour and ten minutes into this. We're gonna have you back on to dig into the bodybuilding stuff. So. I'm going to do an intro after the outro um, to tell people we're not talking about bodybuilding. So, um, (laughs) but anyways, Harrison, it was awesome having you on. It's funny how God works. And, you know, I think this is a really good episode, especially for parents and loved ones that, you know, need to understand, you know, kind of how the intricacies of this stuff works. And uh, yeah, that's it. Ben, any final thoughts? No, it's been awesome. Dude, I love meeting brand new people. And then like, you're literally so much in common it's just wild between our addictions and life stories and it it is crazy because like i I came here just to tour yeah i I heard about you guys years ago before i even started working in the field like i have a shirt of y'all's in my closet like that's super that's old old you get it from adam no no i got it from a guy named joel he doesn't even live in florida anymore i think he like worked out with y'all one hand you know Uh, that's my cousin bro 
No shit. He used to be in my sponsorship. Fit. Whoa, shit. <laughs> the, the, uh, he used to be really? in my family. All right. So <laughs> I know all those guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's me. Yeah, that's his cousin. That's my crazy cousin, Joel. Uh, Joel, yeah. what's up? Yeah. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. So like, dude, because like we used to go to the gym at the same time and stuff like that. And he was in my family and like, you know what I mean? And so like, I was like, yo, I have y'all's <laughs> shirt. <Dude. And> so, <laughs> But that's so another thing. That's crazy. Another yeah. connection besides the gym, besides recovery. I came here for a meeting and now y'all got sitting me in front of a microphone. Joel's you know the one I mean? that got me working out, dude. I, Joel's I beast. Let me take two seconds. <laughs> two seconds. So he, he's uh, four years older than me, I think. Yeah, four years. And his dad was really into, into weightlifting, had a full gym in his garage, yeah. basically. And on the patio. And uh, I remember I'm out there. Joel has three of his closest buddies out there. And I remember they, they take, they're all benching. Like they were just getting into working out the last few months. And they're like, Ben, give it a shot. I remember, dude, I, I get the bar off on the bench. I'm fine. I unlock my elbows, dude. <laughs> and it just drops on my chest. And Joel's laughing at me, dude. And I'm like, never again, you jerk. <laughs> Watch this. I'm, your little cousin's going to be bigger than you. Yeah, yeah, Him well, and I are sure. funny, dude. He's a, The first thing he does when, when we start talking, he's like, what are you benching? <laughs> or I'll like start flexing. He's like, I think my arms are bigger. You, you know what's he's, crazy when people see that I work out and I'm not wearing my work clothes and maybe I'm like at a meeting and I have a tank yeah. top on and someone they'll be like, how much you bench? And I'll be like, dude, I haven't touched a barbell for a flat bench in years because oh, I really? bum shoulders. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to rip one out of its socket. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. After my show, I tore my rotator cuff because I tried to do something else. But I guess we'll, I'll we'll make cover you guys that next yeah, exactly. Sorry, you brought up Joel, dude. I couldn't <laughs> help myself. The one-handed bandit. Yeah. <laughs> That's a story for itself, too. Dude, he seriously. was on the podcast years ago. Did we bring him on? I think so. Yeah. Anyways. Neither here nor there. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, we did because he he talked about how he broke into the courthouse. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. With one yeah. hand. Yeah. With, with, which is crazy. All right. That is it for this episode of Real Recovery Talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us info at realrecoverytalk.com. Again, that's info at realrecoverytalk.com. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. And please go to Facebook and join our support group, Real Recovery Talk Support Group. You have to put talk in there, Real Recovery Talk Support Group. That is it. We will see you all later.